him to speak to you this morning on finding your place in the kingdom of God. I believe everybody has a place to work in the kingdom of God. I don't believe anybody was brought into the kingdom to sit on the pew and look for me. Well, it's true anyway. Hallelujah. Appreciate Brother Kirkman. He's from somewhere in Alabama. And I don't know where to tell you because when he told me I went to preach for him, he told me one town and the church was listed in another town. And so I don't know where I was at, but I was somewhere in Alabama. But we had a great time. We have a great church. Appreciate Brother Kirkman. And to come and to worship you and uh, you missions musicians don't go too far if he needs you I don't know give the Lord a hand clap this Amen. morning Amen. Amen. Yeah. it's so good to be here I'm so honored that Brother Alexander would ask me uh, I, now I'm, I'm not uh, as educated as some of these other guys I still use the old notes the old Bible and the and the pencil and pen, and so you'll have to forgive me. I'm still old school. All right, all right. All right. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, "I'm glad to be here." Glad to be here. You know, I, I I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Right. Amen. And uh, you'll just bear with me just a minute. How many is hearing me for the first time? Amen. Well, you'll never forget me after the death. <laughs> I do want to say that. Uh, any one of you preachers sitting out there this morning that uh, is called of God can beat me preaching. If you ain't called of God, you can't beat me. All right. All right. You know, it takes a calling in order to be a part of the kingdom of God. Yes, it does. And I'm so thankful, so thankful that God called me. Yeah, right. It has been a glorious journey. And let me, let me just say a few things this morning before I start. Uh, I was 15 years old when God filled me with the Holy Ghost. 44 years I've had that Holy Ghost. Yes. God has blessed me. 59 years old now, and I'm enjoying the journey. If you're not enjoying your journey, something's wrong. All right. I've never wanted to look back. I've never wanted to go back on the things of God. I evangelized 14 years, pastored now for 21. And in pastoring these 21 years, we uh, have learned a few things. How many pastors do we have this morning? How many new pastors? You've been pastoring less than a year, a year. Well, we got one. All right. We got a lot of coming. There's a lot of roads to be carried. I, I've got a church and we started with nine members now we run close to right out a hundred got a building that'll only seat a hundred and so we got to build a new building Amen. but God has blessed us yes, and if you've ever been to our church I know brother uh, Alexander's been there I'll put our singers against any singers our musicians against any musicians in the country and I'm not bragging I'm blessed when we went there, my wife was on the piano player. We was out of a church of over 500 members, 64 singers of our family, 26 piano players that could sit down and play any song you wanted to sing. And then we go to a church that had nine members and five of them was my family. You think you want to start a church? You can. But don't think it's going to be easy. I've been there 21 years and had three congregations. All right, all right. Some of y'all grinning? Yeah. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. They'll come and they'll go. Right, yeah. Amen. Amen. Right. And don't get me wrong, don't give up. Right. You can't quit. I've had some to come and go and some to come back. Sure. Yeah. Come on now. And some left and we said, thank you. <laughs> yeah. You all know what you're talking about. Know what I'm talking okay. about. If you ain't, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Amen. That's right. Amen. No, I, I told somebody right before service this morning, uh, Brother Frazier and I was sitting at the front of the church. And Brother Frazier, by the way, out of Corinth, was my pastor for 14 years. Brother J.C. Hall was my pastor for 18 years before that. So 
you know, I, I've had some great pastors, some great mentors. But Brother Frazier and I was sitting in the entrance of the church one morning, one Sunday, and a man walked in and he was just walking through the entrance of the church. And while he was walking through the entrance of the church, Brother Frazier looked at me and said, you know him? I said, no, sir. We just kept sitting there. A few minutes, a lady came in and walked over and said, well, hey, Brother Frazier, and shook, shook his hand and shook my hand. And then Brother Frazier uh, sat there for a minute and he she looked at him and said, Brother Frazier, you ever met my husband? He said, no, ma'am, not that one. <laughs> what do you say? You'll, you'll figure out there's things, folks. And then she went on to say, uh, Brother Frazier, we've been to every church in town, so I thought we'd start again. He said, well, just don't stop. <laughs> when she walked off, he said, she caused me more trouble than anybody in this town ever did. But let me say one more thing, then I'm going to get to the word of the Lord. We was in revival just a few weeks ago. At 15, baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. 12 received the gift of the Holy Ghost. God is still giving it out. Amen. You come to our church, I made this statement back at the Mid-South Conference. If you come to our church, not everybody there is going to look like you do. Not everybody's going to dress like you do. But honey, I ain't running them off either. Don't get me wrong. I believe in wholeness as much as the next man, and I believe it's going to take it to get to heaven. But at the same time, you've got to catch a fish before you can skin it. Amen. We need to build some churches, folks, that's got the Holy Ghost moving in it. And i got a church that's on fire for Jesus. And when I started, brother, I was the only preacher there for 15 years. Now I've got six of them in our church. All right. Every one of them received the Holy Ghost under my ministry. Every one of them been taught by the Word of God through my ministry. And honey, they'll preach the Word of God for you. And what can I say? Thank you, Jesus, for your blessings on me. We need a move of God that will stir all of hell and make hell sit up and say, Hey, we need to pray through. Is falling apart. We've got families that are falling apart. We've got children that are being lost. We've got to reach heaven in order to see them touch heaven. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen? I made this statement that I'm going to move. Out of the way. The Bible says lay every way to side that so easily assets you. Excuse me. Went to Illinois, preached a revival up in Aurora, Illinois, several years ago, and a lady came up after church and said, Brother Kirkman, it's not proper to take your coat off. I said, Honey, I'm not preaching proper either. I'm preaching hell hot and heaven high. So that's the way I feel this right. morning. But you know, I've seen a lot of things. I don't care if you ain't got but six members in your church. If you've got 100 members or 600 members or you've got 6,000 members. Honey, you've got a job. You've been picked to do a job. Yes. You got to stay with that job till that job's finished. All right. Until Amen. God releases you, you got work to do. We had a revival and the minister made this statement during this revival. He looked at me and said, Brother Kirkman, how many people do you have in this town? I said, 1,400. He said, how many do you have in your county? I said, 14,000. He said, let me ask you this. Are you doing God's numbers? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, have you won 10% of them yet? All right. And I stopped and I thought for a minute, 1,400, I should be running 140 if I'm using God's number of 10%. And then if you use God's number of 14,000, I should be running 1,400. I'm going to ask you the same question this morning, pastors. Have you won your city yet? Have you won your county yet? Have you seen everybody in your area filled with the Holy Ghost? Right. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was in South Carolina preaching revival. Me and my wife went to a store just walking through, passing the time of day off. While we were standing in the store, we was looking at some gift wrapping paper and things of that nature. A couple across from us began to talk to us. While they was talking to us, they said, what are you doing in our area? Well, I don't know you. And he's a barber there in the town of Easley, South Carolina. And I said, well, I'm not from here. He said, well, Brother Kirkman, what are you doing? He said, well, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm here in revival. 
He said, well, what's your name? And I told him. He said, well, Brother Kirkman, where are y'all preaching at? We told him where we was preaching at. There in Easley at Crosswell Pentecostal Apostolic Church. I said, come on over and be with us. They said, we just might do that. Did you know on Wednesday night, they walked into that service. Never been to a Pentecostal church. Never been to a Pentecostal outlaw part of the Holy Ghost. They told me when I started to leave. They said, Brother Kirkman, when you're back in town, let us know. I said, I don't have to be here for you to get the Holy Ghost. You can come any time. These doors is open. Honey, we need to tell somebody about Jesus. That soul that is searching for a move of God. Amen. There's people Amen. this morning a move of God that we stuck behind our walls. Yes, sir. You go with me this morning. Uh, Lord, I have mercy. I'll get to this in a minute. Go ahead. Matter of fact, Brother Luna's supposed to preach after me, so he's the only thing standing between you and your lunch. <laughs> I begin to think the other week as me and my grandson were riding on my mule. Now, I got a four-wheel mule, not a four-legged mule. And we started riding my mule, and while we was riding my mule, we pick up cans around the area. I taught my grandkids, and they'll they'll say, Mom and Daddy, we gotta go pick up cans. We gotta raise money for the young folks at the church. Yeah, right. Yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with that. We carry off about a twelve to fifteen hundred dollars worth every year. Cool. So if you ain't doing it, it'd be you a good fundraiser. Yeah. Get your kids taught. Yeah. And honey, they'll enjoy picking them up. But anyway, we was riding along up to the dirt road and my grandson looked at me. He's only eight years old. He looked at me and said, Papa? I said, yeah, son. He said, where's that property? I said, what property? He said, that property where we're going to build that new church at. I said, well, it's over yonder. We hadn't even bought it as of yet. This was back in October of last year. He said, he said, would you take me over? I said, yeah. I said, I said, you'll just have to bear it with me now. I said, I got to turn around. He said, well, turn around, let's go. We drove around over on to that property. You see, over 20 years ago, I claimed that property in Jesus' name. I walked up on it and said, this is our property. This is where we need to build a church. This is where we've got to build a church. I talked to the man three different times, asking him to sell the church, the property. He said, I can't do it. I'm going to build me a house there. Every time he'd tell me to build a house, I'd say, no, you ain't. When I'd drive away, I'd say, no, you ain't. We'd pray a little bit more. My grandson, when we drove up on that property, he said, stop, Papa. I stopped. He stepped off. I'm talking about an eight-year-old boy. He stepped off of that mule, walked over in the middle of that grass field, knelt down in the middle of that field, buried his head in the grass, began to pray and say, Jesus, we need this property. You know we need this property. He got up, threw both hands in the air, began to walk around in circles over that property. You want to know what happened? In December, we bought that property and wrote a check for it. You want to know what God will do? God will take out of the mouths of babes and hang he can use a child. Do not give up on God. Wherever God puts you, hang tight. God is not there with you. If God sends you somewhere, He shows you to do something. That's right. You got your Bibles this morning in 2 Kings chapter 20. Then I'm going to Matthew also. Chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 20 verses 1 through 6 says. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet said the son of Amos came to him and said unto him. Thus saith the Lord set thy house in order for thou shalt die and not leave. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord saying. I beseech thee O Lord. Remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept so. And it came to pass afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard Thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. 
Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto the days fifteen years. And will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake. And for my servant David's sake. If I should leave with you it thought this morning it would be this. You have been picked. Or you have been chosen, whichever term you want to use this morning. And if I should subtitle this, it would be, where will you bury your heart? Where will you bury your soul? I'm asking you this morning, what did you come here for? Did you just come to see a preacher stand in the pulpit and scream at you? Or did you come to feel the anointing power of God? Did you come to hear somebody, somebody praying unto God? Did you come to see somebody healed? Did you come to see somebody resurrected? Honey, I came this morning to tell you, my God is real. Can I hear an amen? Amen, amen. amen? You may be seated. We look at these scriptures. I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth. Let me just show you something. The Bible says the Lord, the Lord sent Isaiah to tell Hezekiah to set his house in order because he was going to die. I come to tell you this morning, set your houses in order. I'm not just talking about this house. I'm talking about your church houses. If you ever preach holiness, we need to preach holiness today. If you ever talk people about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we better teach it more than we ever have. If you've ever baptized in Jesus' name, this world needs to hear about the Jesus' name. Time. Honey, we need a move of the old-fashioned Holy Ghost that we've never seen before. I've got people that are hungry and starving for a move of God. Yes. Amen. Amen. I don't know. I've been watching Brother Luna's services some on Facebook and I'm on Facebook also. We're live now. Lord, I didn't think I'd do any good. We only have about 100 people in our congregation. I didn't think I'd ever do any good. We had 2,200 people viewing us the other night. All right. I said, oh God. Where's all these folks at? We had a lady to call from Utah and ask for prayer during the course of one of our services. You want to know how to reach the world? You've got to reach out to the world. You want to know how to tell somebody about Jesus? You've got to quit closing it up inside your four walls and say, hey, we've got a move of God going on in Southern Alabama. And if you want to move, you've got to cry unto God and let God begin to give you an outpouring Hezekiah, Hezekiah, here he is. Set your house in order. You're going to die. We all going to die. But Hezekiah, you're going to die. Son, we was in service one night a number of years ago. Brother Swain was there. Some of you may know him. I don't know if you do or not. He walked back to a man four nights in a row. Said, set your house in order. You're going to die and you're going to die suddenly. Not one night did he move. Not one time did he change his lifestyle. Not one time did he give his life to Jesus. They take him home and they tell him on the way home, you got to be born again. you got to be baptized in Jesus' name. He said, I just can't do it right now. Two weeks after that revival closed, he walked out to a garbage can filled with garbage, lit it, set it on fire, bent over into it, would he bent over into it. Two aerosol cans blowed up, throwed fire all over it, blowed half his face off. Honey, he went to the hospital talking to everybody. Half of this face gone. When he got into the hospital, he went into gang green and he ended up dying in the hospital asking somebody to pray, asking somebody to touch heaven for him. He he said, I cannot feel God anymore. I've got to feel God. But he died dead. Honey, I'm telling you, this morning, whenever you can pray and touch heaven, you better touch him while he may be found. Because the day may come when you cry over him. And he will not be there. You 
can't afford. God. You can't afford to wait. You can't afford to set everything on the sides. You got to do it now. Today is the day. Today. You say, well, preacher, you're preaching to a lot of preachers. Yes, I am. And you better be preaching to your church. You better be telling folks at home, I don't care if you're a preacher or if you're just a child of God. You got a job to do. You got, you've been called. You haven't been given this Holy Ghost just for the fun of it, honey. It's been given to you because somebody in your household needs to feel the presence of God. Somebody in your life needs to find Jesus. Somebody needs to touch heaven. And you may be the only key that unlocks that door. Amen. That's right. How many of you sitting here? That's right. Could be like Hezekiah. Set your house in order. You're going to die. The Bible says he turned his face to the wall and began to pray. And God heard his cry. How many of you sitting here this morning, if you was to cry out to God, God would really hear you? Or would you have to pray through before you felt Jesus? Come on now. Preach you better hear me this morning. I didn't just come from Alabama just to look at you. I came to warn you that there's a hell to shut and a heaven to gain. And God's looking for whomsoever will. Let him come. God's looking for you. God's asking for you. God's seeking for you. God's wanting you to change the life of the people around you. God's wanting you to reach out. You see, I'm blessed. I'm blessed beyond measure. I've got three boys. All of them filled with the Holy Ghost. All of them preaching this gospel. All right. Thank you, Lord. I got three daughter-in-laws. All three of them filled with the Holy Ghost. All of them seeking God. Matter of fact, I talked to my daughter-in-law. My wife did on the way to church this morning. She said, Amanda, where are you at? She said, I'm at the church. What are you doing at the church? She said, oh, I just come out here just to be closer to Jesus. Right. Thank you, Lord. How many of you have got family that's wanting to be closer to Jesus? I'm asking you this morning, have you been picked or have you been chosen for a job such as this? In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19, and I'm trying to hurry this morning because I can promise you I won't get through. How many of you preachers can say the same thing? Matthew chapter 6, verses 19, very familiar reading. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither their moth nor rust doth corrupt where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I'm asking you this morning, where are you burying your heart? Where are you putting the things that your heart is desiring? Where are you searching? You see, I told you a while ago, I'm blessed. I was 15 when God filled me with the Holy Ghost. I came out of what you call a split home. My mother had the Holy Ghost. My daddy did not. I've watched my daddy knock my mother cold as a cucumber to keep her from going to the house of God. I've watched him take batteries off the vehicles to keep her from going to the house of God. I've seen him argue with her and cuss her out just because she wanted to go to the house of God. But you want to know what? Every time, every time she'd wake up, she'd get ready again. She'd be ready to go to church again the next night, the next service. She wanted to be in the house of God. She had a desire to see a move of God. You want to know why I'm here today? It's because of a praying mother that stood for God and said, I refuse. I refuse to let Satan defeat me. I refuse to quit and go back. That's right. I'm talking about a lady. When she got the Holy Ghost, my mother, fired a circle saw. Weighed 140 pounds, soaking wet. They'd be playing cards. Some of y'all may know what I'm talking about. I never did know a lot of that, but anyway. They played cards. Somebody would be cheating and she'd go across the table on <laughs> Didn't matter how big they was, she'd sail across the table on Cuss like a sailor. Wore a poor boy's haircut. That's my haircut. Smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. 
had her daddy when she got the Holy Ghost point his finger in her face and said, you're no daughter of mine if you live in such a way as this. She said, daddy, I cuss like a sailor. I'd whoop anybody that said the wrong word to me. I'd fight a circle saw if they didn't whoop me. And now that you're telling me that I can't live for God, you're telling me that I don't want to be a part of the family of God. She said, Daddy, God's more real to me right now than he's ever been. I cannot afford to turn around and go back. What did she do? For the next three years, we didn't go back to that house. For three years, I listened to my mother beg God, let me go home before I die. Before daddy dies, let me go home. I've got to go home, please. Three years. Thanksgiving morning. Not too far from now. Thanksgiving morning, telephone rang. I answered the phone. Man on the other end said, your mama there? Who is this? This William or Steve? I said, this is William. Steve's my brother. Said, your mama there? I said, yeah. I said, mama, there's a man on here who won't talk to you. Daddy said, who is he? <laughs> yeah. Mama walked over and took the phone. While she was talking, tears began to stream down her face. When she hung the phone up, she dropped to her knees in the middle of that kitchen and began to speak in an ugly language, speaking in tongues. Crying unto God, Daddy jumps up and runs over, grabs her, says, What's wrong with you, woman? Get up! She said, I'm going home. I'm going home. We're going home Christmas. We walked in down there Christmas Day. Honey, when we walked in, I had a 97 year old great haired grandmother sitting over there that was an old Methodist lady. We walked into that house, and when we did, Ma Cook grabbed me and hugged me, grabbed my brother and hugged him. When Mother grabbed him, she began to hug her. My grandmother, that bony finger, I still remember it pointing like this. She pointed it right at my mother. She said, we didn't know what to call it, Delilah. We didn't know what it was that we had. But she said, I've done that jibber-jabbering. I've done that praying. I've been baptized and I'm ready to go to heaven. Don't give up. Don't go back. Don't change your way. And I remember my granddaddy looking at her saying, hey, I'm getting old, mama. And she said, I'll stand in judgment for it. But she said, you need exactly what we are as God. We're telling you today, honey, you need exactly what God says you need. And that's the baptism of the Holy Ghost running over full to the breath of her to where you can feel the presence of God. Every time you come to the house of God, I don't care if it's a Wednesday night. Guess what? People get the Holy Ghost on Wednesday night. That's right. Amen. And I told you earlier, Brother Luda, we got some of the best musicians I'll put up against anyway. Amen. Other night, the Holy Ghost got to move. You know, that's that thing God gives. Holy Ghost. He started moving. Not the Holy Spirit either. Come on, Holy now. Ghost. Holy Ghost. I'm like the little boy running up to Rex Johnson. I said, I'll come tonight to get Holy Ghost in again. That's what I come today for, is to get Holy Ghost in again. Amen. Right. Amen. 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 <laughs> you see, a lot of folks need to get the Holy Ghost again. That's right. Amen. They need a move of God, honey. That'll literally stir every one of us like we've never been stirred. Hezekiah, here it was. He was dying. But yet he turned his face to the wall and God heard his cry. And then we read where the Bible says, where your heart is, there will your treasures be also. I'm asking you this morning, where are you burying your heart? I remember reading a story. This was in the 1800s. A man by the name of Robert Moffat was at, was at London preaching the word of God. And it was a snowy night. And no one showed up that night but a bunch of ladies. And those ladies that showed up, little did Robert Moffat know that there was a man standing up by the pipe organs up on the top floor of the third balcony of the church. While he was standing up there, his name was Dave Livingstone. And while he was standing there, the Bible said that while Moffat was preaching the word of God, that young man ran down from up in that balcony, ran down and received the gift of God on a snowy night with a house full of women preaching that night. 
that young man became one of the greatest missionaries to Africa that ever was. He was one of the greatest missionaries. He traveled some 19,000 miles by foot, preaching the word of God, carrying the word of God for the next 40 years. The queen of all of England said, this man has been sent to emancipate and to raise forth the blessings of God throughout all of England and now he's died and he's buried in West Abbey Mar uh, West Abbey Ministry right now but you want to know what he said in his dying words he said bury my body in America but bury my heart in Africa I'm asking you this morning where are you going to bury your heart where are you is it going to be in the things of God is it going to be in the things of the world I'm asking you where will you want to bury your heart I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. You better give everything you've got to Jesus right now. Yes, I don't care, Brother Alexander, that you may be 80-something years old. Honey, you still got a job to do. You can't afford to quit. You can't afford to go back. There's somebody like me that's needing a touch. There's somebody out there that's needed a move with God. Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord. You remember a man by the name of Sam Sasser in 1960. Sam Sasser served to the missionary to the Marshall Islands and Samoa. He helped establish 26 churches. He pastored in Honolulu, California, and even here in the state of Texas. Talk, excuse me, I'm running out of breath. I'm trying to hurry. Talk conferences in over 63 nations. This prayer was offered at his Funeral. Bury my body, but do not bury my love. Bury my eyes, but do not bury my vision. Bury my feet, but do not bury my path of life. Bury my hands, but do not bury my efforts. Bury my shoulders, but do not bury my concern. Bury my voice, but do not bury my message. Bury my mind, but do not bury my dreams. Bury me, but do not bury my life. If you must bury something, bury all of my sins, bury my weaknesses, but let me love for the Jesus that I have. Go forward and rest on life and people's soul throughout eternity. The Bible, it goes on to say on December the 14th, his family members boarded a plane and carried his last request out. Bury my body in America, but bury my heart in the Marshall Islands where I've lived and preached the word of God. Bury this body anywhere you want to bury it, but bury me with Jesus. Do you hear me? Bury me with the things of God. I've seen God do too much to quit on him now. I've seen him move too many things. Honey, you want to go. There's been times in pastoring that church of 21 years. There's been times when I wanted to walk out. There's been times on a Sunday morning I remember standing one Sunday being chewed out by one of the church members at that time. Chewed out one side spit out and I hadn't even done a thing. One of the members of the church done what he was accusing me of. And I just stood there and took it. When he got through, I said, how many wants me to stay and how many wants me to go? There was a 67-year-old woman in our church. Stood up in the back of the church and she said, Brother Kirkman, I don't know what this is all about, don't care. But she said, wherever you go, I'm going. Because that's where Jesus is going. And I want to be a part of Jesus. Right. I'm not saying that for me. I'm saying I thank God that I had enough of love of God in me that somebody wanted to follow me. Somebody, somebody wanted to reach out and touch heaven for me. As she stood and said that that Sunday, there was people standing all over the church. Finally, somebody looked over at him and said, Sir, you need to take your seat. You've already lost this battle. After church, he came up to me and started to chew me again. The man that was at fault 
walked up to him and said, Junior, I done that and you accused me. Jesus hung on the cross because he was falsely accused. Jesus took a whipping because he was falsely accused. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be spit on. You're going to be made fun of. You're going to be laughed at. You're going to be persecuted. But through it all, honey, Jesus is still there. Jesus is still there. Jesus is still there. Amen. My son, my baby boy, he's a doctor by trade, physical therapist doctor. Sat on the piano stool the other Wednesday night. I walked into the church, Brother Luna. I studied all week, studied, prayed, fasted. God, give me a message. I walked up to the platform. Sung a few songs. I turned around. I said, boys, three of the preachers were sitting right behind the pulpit. One of them plays the bass. One of them plays the drums. One of them plays the piano. I said, boys, I don't know. But I ain't got the message tonight. I said, I don't know if you've ever felt that way or had to do that. That's just me. I try to find the anointing of God for every service. Right. Some people don't have the legacy I have now. That you can just turn around and say, I don't have the message. Before I could even get message out good, that boy kicked that stool back on that piano, jumped up, grabbed his Bible and said, I was waiting on you to give me the floor. Honey, he walked up to that pulpit, started preaching the word of God. People began to shout all over the house. He never quit preaching. He just kept right on preaching. Next thing I knew, brother, I can't do it. And he's going to try. But my son was standing behind the pulpit, flat footed, leaped and landed on the pulpit, standing up in front of everybody. That thing wondered how to flip over 15 times its own wheels. And him standing up on it, preaching the word of God in front of everybody, standing out doing this right here, shaking back and forth. Next thing I knew, he jumped off the front, landed down in front of everybody, said, you want Jesus? Come and get it. Honey, four or five people jumped up right to the altar all at one moment. You want to know what God will do? God can move on a Wednesday night just as sure as I'm standing. Honey, don't give up on any servant. You can't afford somebody. Somebody can look at for that night servant. God doesn't bring people to the house of God by accident. How long have I been preaching? Thank you, Lord. No, you told me to stay an hour. Pick it. I'm telling you, folks, we got a job on our hands. It only takes one person to change a city. It only takes one move of God to change a life. Yes, sir. That one person, that one person sitting on your church pew that you don't think can do anything can be the biggest soul winner you've got in our house. Right. Some of you may remember a man by the name of Jimmy Russell. He was a dear friend of ours. Been in his church, sung in his church, and never did get called to preach before we went there, but before he resigned the church, he started his church in Madisonville, Kentucky, in his carport. A year later, I think he had nine or twelve, something like that, in Sunday school the first Sunday. A year later, he had the same thing. He said, I went out behind my house. He had a clock. He, he, he was a clock maker. And I mean, I'm talking about a genius with those old wind-up clocks. He had a building out behind. He emptied it one Sunday afternoon. His wife went out there and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm building me a prayer closet. He said, I've got to have somewhere where I can talk to God. He said, I'm not seeing what I need to see happen in our churches. He said, I'm wanting to see God move in our midst. And God spoke to him. Wife forgot to pray in that closet that afternoon. God spoke to him and said, get a radio program. He said, I can't afford a radio program. He said, you can't afford not to have a radio program. Brother Russell said, I paid $2.50 a month. 
for 30 minutes at a time. This is back in the 30s. Wow. He said, I started that program. He said, two weeks later, he said, a lady called me, said to Brother Russell, tell me where your church is. He said, I told him how to get to my garage in my carport, because that's where I was having church in my carport garage. He said, they backed her up in a station wagon. Some of you older ones will know what I'm talking about, a station wagon. She was bed fast. She was on a bed, couldn't even get up. They opened the back door of that little old house church, rolled her in on the cot, parked her in the middle of the floor. Brother Russell said, I walked back to her and said, Hun, did you come for God to heal you? She said, no, sir. But I did come. If that Holy Ghost is as real as you said it was today on the radio, I came for it, and I want it tonight. He said, we begin to pray for that lady on that cot. He said, we carried her down to the river and baptized her in Jesus' name right here in Kentucky. She came up out of the water on a mattress, speaking in tongues. I'm talking about being baptized on a mattress. You want to know something else? That lady couldn't come to service every time the doors is open, but she'd pick up the phone and say, hey, you go in my place. She grabbed the phone book and started calling numbers and asking me to go to the house of God in her place. When Brother Russell resigned the church, he had 264 members of that church that was responsible for that one woman because she invited them to the house of God and they received the Holy Ghost. When he left that church, they was running 864 in Sunday school. Honey, I'm telling you, don't look at the number you got in front of you. Look at what's coming. Look at what's coming. Don't look at behind you. You've got to look forward in order for God to move. Don't tell me that God can't move in your town just like he's moving in ours. Don't tell me that he can't bless you just like he's blessed me. It's not always easy. And you may want to throw your hands up and say, I can't do it. But every time you get to that point, find yourself a closet. Look around you. Look around you. Look around you. I think it'll close. I think. That's the first time anyway. Musicians move on up here. I don't know what you came looking for. I don't know what your needs are. You see, I got a middle son. But you, I told you I'm blessed. I got a middle son that should be in a wheelchair today. When he was four years old, he was diagnosed with junior rheumatoid arthritis. The doctors told us by the time he was 20 years old, he'd be in a wheelchair for life. My uncle Leon Frazier wrote the song the next time you see me. He wrote the song, I'll have a new body, praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. He wrote a lot of the songs you may hear. One night at the home church, we got to church on that Sunday night. They were singing. One sang about heaven and the other to sing about green pastures. Didn't nothing fit. Didn't nothing come together. Y'all been in some of those services, I'm sure, where it seemed like you couldn't, couldn't shake the whole church and feel anything. Somebody sent a note up that night. How the old faith would sing, I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. You see, on Tuesday, when, when he got diagnosed at Labonis Children's Hospital, Dr. Randy Lazar diagnosed him with junior rheumatoid arthritis. Wednesday, we went to church and told everybody, Thursday, we go back to the doctor and they give us more bad news. On Sunday morning, I get out of the car and start across the parking lot and a lady lives way up in Tennessee, not even a preacher, not even a, just, just a lady that goes to church and wrote me a note three weeks or four weeks earlier and gave it to 
her daughter and said, here, carry this to William. Brother Kirkman, he's going to need it. I got the letter. I've got it. As a matter of fact, it's out in the vehicle now. It's in my briefcase. I got the letter, and all of it was to me on the front and back. Last paragraph, though, and this was three or four weeks before my son even knew he was sick. Fret not about thy son. The hand of God is upon him. I walked on into church after reading that. Aunt Gail sitting in the lobby of the church. He said, William, come here. I walked over. Aunt Gail said, William, a preacher friend of yours called from Toronto, Ontario, Canada this morning and said to tell you not to worry about your boy. God's God. I went through that day, asked, prayed. That Sunday night, that faithful quartet started singing, I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord, I'll have a new life. I'd watch my little four-year-old boy for four days drag his leg because it hurt so much for him to walk on it. Hold to the wall, coming up the hall. So he didn't have to put no weight on that leg. Come to my kitchen table and sit in my lap, hug my neck and say, Daddy, I'm hurting. I'm hurting. That Sunday night, he walked up to me. We sat on the third section, the side of the church, third pew back. He pulled on my pants leg, Brother White, and said, Daddy, can I run for Jesus? Dr. Lazar done told us you let him run, he'll be a cripple. He'll break the bones in his body and they ain't stout enough to carry him. He's got arthritis in those knees and they'll break. That's the first thing the devil popped into my head. You let him run, he'll be a cripple. I looked at him and I thought for a minute and I said, God, I'd rather have him crippled for you than whole for Satan. I looked down at that Brian and I said, Brian, you run, boy. And you give it all you got. You give it to Jesus. That's right. He took off around that church. I mean, it's a large church. Three sets of rows of pews, 24 pews in each section, all the way around that church. He went, seemed like it took eternity. When he got back to where I was sitting, he grabbed that pants leg again, pulled it, jerked on it. Said, Daddy, can I do it again? I said, Yeah, son, you do it as many times as you need to. Yes. But honey, he wasn't by himself that time. Right. Honey, that congregation exploded. Yeah. People went to run it. We had a fast lane and a slow lane. Yeah. The slow lane was one that felt like this in the middle. And the fast lane was one that like this around the outside. Yeah. Honey, you want to know what happened before it was over? Brian went home. We went to the doctor on Tuesday again. When we went back, they couldn't find anything wrong with our boy. You want to know what's happening this morning? He's still running for Jesus. And he's preaching this gospel. I'm telling you, God knows how to make a difference in your lives. It's too late to tell me there's not a reason why. Oh, I ain't through. I'm going to quit. I'm telling you this morning, as you stand with us,